providing advocacy with incarcerated survivors. Now we want to talk specifically about the forensic exam setting as there are several differences between this and in community. As you've learned, the PREA standards require facilities to do many things. One of those, um, or one part of that, is uh, access to confidential external victim services, and that's where you come in. Um, one of those standards that requires access uh, to victim services relates to the forensic and medical exam, and is something um, that is similarly available to survivors in the community. So this PREA standard requires that, as requested by the victim, if that's what they want, the victim advocate can accompany and support the victim through the forensic exam and provide support after that. The DOC has a number of policies that relate to the forensic exam. Some of them are medical management. How do we deal with this from a medical perspective or aggravated sexual assault checklist? So if they're coming to the community medical center, they're going to have been involved in an aggravated sexual assault, um, and so there will be a completed checklist. Uh, forensic medical exam procedures for community health care facility, forensic medical exam procedures for transportation staff, forensic medical exam procedure for DOC health care staff, and then our retention of evidence. So how are we collecting evidence for sexual assault evidence collection? how we're collecting the clothing, which has changed. All these policies are available to you on the DOC external website. And if you need help, you can reach out either to your site, your site liaison or to WICSAF, who can help you get the policies. As you're learning more about the forensic exam response with incarcerated survivors, remember that the security procedures that are in place are there for your safety. Um, part of this is pre-screening and obtaining a DOC badge that has your photo. This badge is a pink badge that has a photo and it's um, a unique badge to you. It's not a type of badge that's used um, for other folks that are coming into facilities. And that's because um, we needed a picture to make sure that you were specifically identified, but the pink badge um, connotes uh, someone like an attorney is coming in who is going to be escorted um, to where they're going by staff and is clear that they're not a DOC staff person. Um, in terms of frequency of forensic exams, DOC is reporting that there's approximately one per month statewide, so they're not very frequent right now, but we anticipate that may increase as knowledge of pre reporting and confidential support increases across the state. Um, you have probably thought of this, especially if you're serving um, a men's facility, but the dynamics of these exams may be different than in community. A majority of the inmate exams um, are men, and that may not be something that you're used to responding to. So please think about that and prepare for that prior to being there with a the survivor. The hospital location um, may be different than where you respond to survivors in the community, and your program will know what the hospital is. So make sure to check in with your supervisor and other people who've been doing this pre response um, prior to you starting and find out where that hospital location is and anything you need to know about that that may be different to the hospital you respond to in the community. So when a case meets the 120-hour criteria for aggravated assault, meaning that they would be transported to a community hospital, we're going to offer them, as a DOC facility, we're going to offer them the opportunity to go to the hospital so that they can participate in the forensic medical exam. And we are asking them to, if they have a declination of that service, that they would do that at the hospital. So that that is done with an external third party for reasons that I'm sure you can imagine, that we want to make sure that they have the ability to have the, the procedure explained to them by somebody who has the expertise in the area rather than a DOC staff member who might not know the intensity or what goes on during that forensic medical exam. As police mentioned, the person explaining the forensic medical exam will be either a sane or an advocate. Um, another reason for that is uh, that power dynamics exist um, between DOC staff and inmates. So having someone explain it who isn't part of that dynamic um, can give the survivor the best opportunity to make um, an informed choice about whether they want to obtain that exam or not. So as you can imagine, because these exams are taking place in community, survivors will be transported um, to the exam and will not um, 
go through the exam on site at the DOC facility. You need to work out how you fit into the transport procedure, and most likely your program has worked that out um, with your prison already to find out what that looks like. Um, one of the things that will be in a very extensive checklist that DOC has uh, for any time they're transporting someone is contacting you. Um, we want to make sure that this experience is as successful as possible, and there probably will be some bumps along the way, but um, just be thinking of things like um, if your hospital would normally call out for an advocate, make sure you coordinate with them so that they know that in this case um, the prison is calling you and you're the pre-trained advocate and that's how you're responding rather than just whoever is on call on your crisis line. You know, this coordinated system response will ensure that, it, um, that it's accessible for all the partners and these are building system relationships that will benefit your work with survivors in the community as well because you're interacting with folks um, like at a hospital that can be one of your partners regularly as well. So at the hospital, some of the logistics from the DOC perspective that I want you to think about are that taking somebody to the hospital is one of the most dangerous functions that a prison can perform for many reasons, because there's exposure to the community, there is the ability to plan those trips, there is always a thought that something could be planned, that they call out and use this as a way to escape or bring in some kind of contraband. So really thinking about that, thinking about where we're gonna be at the hospital during this exam, what can you bring into the room? I'm gonna say, don't bring anything you usually would bring. Don't bring your resources, don't bring your keys, and certainly don't bring your cell phones. So really thinking about, again, looking back on the information I gave you earlier about not having your cell phone accessible or keys um, with the resources, if there's a resource needed later, I would use the staff person to get to disseminate that resource rather than handing it directly to make sure that you're not putting them in harm's way. Um, the use of restraints does not necessarily indicate a high violent offender. So really keeping in perspective that our transport teams are gonna do a thorough evaluation when they're taking somebody out. And so there will be times that there might be up to four transportation staff. There will be times that there will be one transport staff, but that depends on classification level and a lot of factors go into that. So just trust in the process and know that in this way, we really are aware of what we're doing. We're balancing the safety of transport staff, hospital staff, the community, the advocate, plus the heightened flight risk, plus, you know, this is a pretty traumatic situation for the offender. So um, not asking a ton of questions about restraints in front of the offender, but do know that the amount of restraint used is based on community risk. Mm -hmm. And trust that um, DOC is the expert in safety and, and security and that they've made a choice um, based on that, based on all those factors and um, it may indicate that the inmate is agitated due to the transport or due to the trauma, and again, doesn't necessarily indicate um, that they have some, are someone that's committed a violent offense. Um, in terms of resources, I want to let you know that um, there are resources in each facility that you can refer inmates to, so please contact WICSAP or talk with your agency about what the most current resource is that has been avail made available in prisons for um, survivors of sexual assault. As you can imagine, um, this is a complicated situation for maintaining confidentiality. And um, in reality, you will have a limited ability to have confidential conversations in this setting. So if it does happen that you don't have the opportunity to have a private conversation um, with the inmate, which is highly likely, um, please make sure to refer that person to the confidential hotline where they can connect with you and have that confidential conversation. That doesn't mean that you can't still um, do your job and support that person during uh, the traumatic exam, but it may not be the time to share confidential information. Um, in terms of room space for the exams, your program has probably worked with the prisoner work release that you are connected with um, to make sure that the space used for exams is one that can be as confidential and private as possible. So um, if you're new to this work, uh, go check that out, see what it looks like so that if you're um, advocating with someone you know what to be prepared with. So for follow-up medical care, it's initiated generally, it would be initiated by the offender. Um, we're looking for the, we will use all of our facilities, well, not all of them, but all of the major facilities have medical clinics where they can receive treatment. 
some of the follow-up care will be identified by the hospital that we take them to. And so our medical staff will decide, are we going to follow that? Are we going to take them back? And those would be conversations that would happen between prisons, medical staff, and the local hospital. Um, I have been assured that we will always follow hospital protocol and their recommendations. So I'm unaware of a time that we've not done that. Some of the considerations are continuity of care, so how often do we want to be taking somebody back out into the community? So some of that conversation might, that might be happening between the prison and the hospital is we don't want a weekly appointment to that, to that hospital for many of the reasons named before, that can we do this care in the facility um, and could we treat the injuries locally if it's going to be a daily change of whatever, um, whatever we're dealing with? We want to make sure that we are developing relationships with the hospital as well, and so the facilities are really reaching out to those hospitals that they're using. And a refusal for the exam, I think we've both alluded to it now a little bit, so the refusal is going to happen to a non-DOC person, and we would like that to occur at the hospital. It, it is important that we say that we are not going to go into a use of force situation with an offender who is refusing to go to the hospital. So if they start to be combative, that's not going to be something that we would pursue uh, to force them into a vehicle to go get a forensic exam. DOC's understanding of this is a traumatic thing that someone has gone through and they don't want to put them through further trauma. So as was mentioned, um, followed care normally takes place in facility. So your advocacy in the medical setting is more limited to the forensic exam. Um, you're not necessarily going to be going with someone to appointments that they have in facility, although you may be meeting with them at other times as in-person services begin to take place. Um, you should become familiar with your medical and mental health staff at the correctional facility that you're working with, knowing what kind of services they provide and if you can refer someone to seek those services. So as was mentioned, um, after the forensic exam, the hospital medical staff um, may send back instructions for follow-up care and medications, and as Lee said, DOC will make sure that those um, are taken care of. And um, we wanted to mention what this looks like when someone is um, having follow-up medical care in a facility. The procedure is that they'll be on a call-out list, um, and they must go when they're on call-out. Um, call out is a list of all inmates on a particular day who will be going somewhere outside of their normal area, for example, a new job assignment. So there's no stigma attached to being on call out. It does not um, out the person as a survivor who's obtaining follow up medical care after a forensic exam. In terms of advocacy challenges, um, you have heard from police earlier about the potential for offender manipulation. Be mindful of that in this setting as well. Um, also, think about the attitude of hospital staff that you are encountering. Um, you may have a really positive relationship with hospital staff in terms of responding to survivors in the community. You may not, but hopefully you do. Um, but this, you know, you may encounter attitudes that are different when uh, working with incarcerated survivors in this setting. And really, again, just to make the point that system coordination is essential, that'll make this go smoothly. Um, find out if there is any kind of multidisciplinary team or response team that you all can be on together. I know that some communities have created them expressly for this purpose, um, and that is excellent and is something that um, all communities can look into with this work. there should be a protocol in place in each community for the hospital response that the advocacy agency should be integrated into. So if you haven't read that yet, make sure to get your hands on it and um, figure out what that looks like so that you can be ready to respond. Um, as we mentioned, view the hospital space that's being used for these exams. See whether it's meeting everyone's needs, and if not, see whether the partners need to um, meet and find a new place that you all can uh, have these exams at and find out who you can refer inmates to for particular services within the facility that you're serving. Again, this is um, just a little bit of information about advocacy at the forensic exam with incarcerated survivors. If you have questions about this, please, uh, we welcome you to contact VICSAP and work through uh, any challenges that you experience in this area.